So welcome today. Uh, my name is John Kicklider. I'm Chief Strategist for Daily FX, one of the largest uh, FX research portals. Uh, and in choosing what I wanted to talk about today, there were a number of topics. I gave some of the ones that are why you should perhaps be a little bit concerned about the state of the financial markets today to uh, actually one of uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Daniel, as well as another one who will give a presentation later on today. So I'm not going to focus too much on why you should be concerned about the state of the financial markets, but let's just say that you should be. Um, it's not, I don't think it's not, cons it's not a conspiracy theory to suggest that things are certainly amiss uh, in the state of our, our buildup of equities, for example. Uh, I know S&P 500, a benchmark for all of us in terms of sentiment, I'm the same way, but it's extraordinarily disparate from what you see in the performance of so many other assets that there is definitely something that should be worrying. So instead of covering that, the reason to be concerned, I wanted to cover the next step. So when everyone is panicked, let's say somebody yells fire in a room, I want to be the person that helps you with a plan a little bit more than the person that yells fire. So that's the, the point of what I'm trying to do here today. Standard risk disclaimer. Um, actually, I think there's three of them throughout this. Uh, so when we're talking about things like FX, which we will, there are two currencies that I think uh, really qualify as havens, or at least uh, they do in standard terms. But we're going to talk about their particular uh, uh, unusual aspects. Uh, but FX involving leverage, just like any other product of leverage, be careful with it. Uh, that in particular is always concern. It's a whole other presentation. Uh, treating leverage with a due respect uh, given how much uh, risk that it represents, but I won't go into too much on that. Hypothetical training disclaimer, I don't make any really hypothetical claims on anything here, but uh, just always good to know. So, a little bit about me. I don't know if any of you have ever read my stuff, watched my videos, or joined me in another presentation. Uh, I actually started trading when I was a teenager, 16. I uh, did it through proxy uh, through my mother-in-law, uh, who was not my mother-in-law at the time, so just qualify that. Um, she actually had a lot of experience trading almost everything. It was really impressive, actually. And I think she gets involved, involved the same way that so many others have gotten involved. They've, they had their money managed by someone else, and they just completely got taken for a ride. And my mother-in-law, I mean, many qualities, but one of them is she has very short tolerance for stuff like that. So she ended up learning everything that she could about trading and markets. She traded almost every product known to man and she does a very good job at it. So she's still better than me. Just put throwing that out there. Um, but then uh, as I was learning about, really I started off in options, uh, options mainly on futures. And then I started to learn a little bit about FX because at the time she was really uh, annoyed by, uh, uh, or she was actually doing quite well on Swiss franc futures. This was before Euro was really big. And she started getting into uh, spot FX. Uh, so I had that in my mind when I went off to college. And then in college, I was learning finance and investment as my major. Uh, and I actually started in daily FX as intern number two. Uh, so I've been here for a very long time. Um, and since then, I've risen up and got to the top of the ranks. And now I'm head of strategy. Now, in terms of what I've learned over the, over the time through college and in obviously my professional career, I've focused more on fundamentals, particularly in college. And then things like market structure and behavioral uh, analysis, so uh, psychology of trading. If there were one thing that I would really recommend on anybody to dedicate more time, don't put so much time into like the, the edge, as they say. I've actually done uh, a lot of automated uh, trading, so I've, I've coded stuff, and I have to say that doesn't take a lot. There's strategies, there are many ways to skin a cat, as they say, and it's true of the markets. It's usually our, our individual uh, issues that come from the psychological side. Getting out too early when the trade's going our way, or simply just doubling down on a losing trade. These are, you know, you read them in all the books, but it's absolutely true of the standard person. I am the same way. The way to get around it is to just recognize it and uh, make strategy around it. But then as I get to this stage in my career, my key interest is, is really the psychology of trading because these aspects, the things that we can control in and of ourselves, that's the issue uh, I think most of us are going to compete with as we get, continue along. As we want to become successful, that's what you need to focus most on. So 
our conversation today is very much about appreciating that fact, uh, especially when things are going wrong, going sideways. How you respond is extremely important. And when it's the market that's going sideways, that becomes even more, you get shell-shocked, don't know what to do, and you revert to you know, a standard of what a safe haven is, how to find help. So what am I trying to answer with this particular presentation? I'm trying to make us think about escape plan before it's necessary. I really want us to think about what we should consider to be absolutely safe, and particularly safe in the circumstances that we're dealing with. Everyone believes that the, the safe haven that they're most familiar with is always a safe haven. That is not true. Markets always change. They have to change because capital moves, uh, prioritization, the ever uh, marching forward of economy and, and finance, it will inevitably change. And things have certainly changed in the past 10 years and the past 20 years from what we have considered to be safe havens in the past. So I want us to think a little bit more about that. And in terms of the havens that we're going to talk about, these can also give us very important clues about what we're actually dealing with in the financial market. So rather than just thinking this is something, somewhere I can go with my portfolio if things start going really wrong, you can discern, so gold's going to be one of them that we're going to talk about today, and, and I know a lot of people like gold, uh, and the US dollar, for example. If you can determine which people are going to or towards, you can garner a lot about what's going on in the market, what is driving or motivating that appetite. So we're going to talk about uh, really the differences between these and what it can actually say about the kind of risk aversion that we are in at the time. So before you can talk about safe havens, you have to be able to measure risk. So you have to know that something is going wrong or that volatility is picking up. People are, in essence, moving towards uh, safety. All right. And there are a lot of different ways to gauge uh, risk or just a, a general appetite for, for safe havens. Uh, but I don't actually like the two most popular, especially in the United States, uh, the S&P 500 and the VIX. So the VIX, I presume everyone's aware of. Uh, if you're aware of the VIX, you're definitely aware of the S&P 500. But the volatility index is extremely unreliable. And I say this as somebody who's traded a lot around the VIX. All right, it's extremely unreliable because it represents people who make extremely fallible decisions. So when we're talking about uh, a, a need for safety, how often do you see the VIX pop before the S&P 500 tumbles? And just a qualifier, the VIX is based on S&P 500. It rarely ever happens. They both move as if suddenly shaken out of sleep. So you get very little lead time from that supposed uh, measure of safety. So I'd, pu I'd put out there that you have to be very, very careful about assuming that the VIX is a great measure of fear. It's great for intensity, but it's not a good early signal, which most people like to use it as. If you appreciate for why that is, I don't want to go into too much detail, but because it is based upon people who are buying options on the underlying S&P 500, People buy options as a hedge, typically, because they're usually long S&P 500. I know a lot of you probably go short. I do, shoot, I do too, but the vast majority of capital in the S&P 500 is long only. So the vast majority of options exposure is usually institutional, and it's for safety's purposes. The problem is, when you're making very little return, especially if you're a hedge fund manager, not enough to actually justify your 220, then you're not going to actually take the hedge because it's too expensive. So people go without the safety, they go without the bumpers, uh, and that's when things go really, really wrong, really, really fast. Uh, so it's a fairly poor measure of uh, safety. So what's my favorite? It's actually, I'll show you in the next slide. It's a, it's a visual that shows all the uh, different risk-oriented assets, and you're looking at the correlation between them. So let's say if two things that uh, are usually unrelated, S&P 500 and the emerging market ETF, if those are dropping all at the same time in an intense way, you're fairly likely to see risk aversion. That's going to be a, a sentiment-based move rather than anything else, because otherwise there's very little reason for them to actually align. And it also helps when you have like a fundamental drive. So let's say the Fed losing significant influence over their ability to stabilize the markets and the economy. That, that's always a good uh, catalyst. And lo and behold, we're going to have a FOMC rate decision fairly soon here. Uh, that's going to be coming up 
uh, I believe, next uh, Wednesday. So if you aren't already aware of that, please mark that on your calendars. That's going to be market moving regardless of what asset class you're trading. So here's that uh, chart that I, I was talking about. It, it's a lot of lines. Uh, so just to give you a sense, this is the 12-month rolling performance of the S&P 500. It's actually the top line. Next down is going to be global equities, excluding U.S. Then you get into high-yield corporate uh, debt, or otherwise known as junk bonds. Uh, you'll have emerging markets. You'll have carry trade. You'll have commodities. And I threw in the Fed just because they're a huge influence. So when these things all move in the same direction and with some degree of intensity, I know that that is either risk on or risk off. Because why else would those very, very different assets be aligned? Because they are f motivated by fundamentally different things. So this is my preferred measure of risk to know when things are going long, so, uh, wrong. So when they are going down in tandem and intensely, I know that that's genuine risk aversion. When you see only one drop and significantly, especially if you, if you stick to a certain asset class and it's not global macro in nature. So let's say that you trade shares, single shares or single share futures. You might not get the big picture if all you were looking at is the S&P 500 because that's your overview, that's your big picture. But if you don't look broadly across multiple assets, you might miss the fact that it's not genuinely a full tilt risk aversion. And that's important to know because you don't want to get out of a out of a little shake up, a little hiccup. You want to go for the signal, not the noise, as they say. Okay. So the safe havens we're going to talk about today, hopefully all are familiar, except for the first one, which I, I'm sure that you've heard of, but I want to get you a little bit more intimate with. Uh, we're going to talk about U.S. Treasuries, which is usually the, the wonky portfolio managers, so the professionals uh, safe haven. So when they actually have to take a huge amount of client funds out of speculative assets and they need to move it to somewhere safe, they don't go cash, they go into things like treasuries. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The US dollar, so it looks like most of you are familiar with FX or traded FX outright. The absolute liquidity of the US dollar, it is known as a safe haven and for good reason. However, there are some caveats that you need to be aware of. And if the dollar is acting wonky and risk aversion, it can give you a very important signal for actually trading and seeking out uh, havens or uh, speculative opportunities. The Japanese yen, this is really more of the FX traders haven. Uh, if you aren't you know, heavy in FX trading, then it generally is not going to get on your radar. Um, but it is definitely something that uh, we'll talk about today because if you aren't trading FX, hopefully you are by the, you'll be interested by the time we're done here. Uh, and I'll tell you why this is a, a fairly attractive uh, measure for very particular instances. So when you're getting risk aversion, but not intense risk aversion. And then gold. Uh, so I say this in the event of a financial crisis, break glass kind of situation. That is an, that's more of the, the everything is going and going down kind of mentality. And I'll talk about in particular why it's important now and why it's been doing so well over the past uh, six to eight months. So first, U.S. Treasuries. U.S. Treasuries, I, I think y we have to appreciate and you have to you know, incorporate into your evaluation of how the markets are doing, whether you intend to trade them or not. Most of you don't trade them, I'm sure. Maybe you get into TLT or you get to TBT, those are ETFs associated to it, or Treasury Futures, uh, those are fairly heavily active. Um, but Treasuries, you should understand more as a signal rather than a trading vehicle itself. And that's true of all, all four of these. As long as you uh, appreciate what they, uh, they represent as a signal, I think you'll be much more attuned to the opportunities in the market and to better avoid the risks that you're getting into. But here I have US Treasuries. Um, this is from one of the, the best free databases of, uh, of statistics that you're going to get. This is from the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve, uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve Economic Database. Uh, free data, um, not daily, not timely, but hey, you get a lot of the economic stuff, which you can't get elsewhere. So just a pitch for the Fed if they want to throw me a bone or anything. Um, so what you have here is actually the 10-year Treasury yield, and that is going to be the blue line, and that is associated to the left side of the chart. And on the right side of the chart is U.S. GDP, annual, year over year. All right. Now, the interesting thing is Treasury yields have continuously dropped where GDP has stabilized, which makes one think why the Fed has to be so aggressive with their easing, but uh, I won't. I'll, I'll just hit upon that as we go through our, our conversation. Um, so the textbook view of what Treasuries are. All right, these are the world's 
most liquid, most ubiquitous safe haven asset. All right, and it might not be on your radar, but I'll tell you right now, it's on the radars of people at Goldman Sachs. It's on the, the, radars, the radars of people at the IMF. It's on the radars of the people at the major central banks around the world. And it's certainly on the radar of the Chinese central bank. So treasuries are the, the place you want to go when you need to hold just capital, assets. All right? And you want to hold capital, Just most of us say cash, but you don't want to hold cash. Because especially today, in today's world, where there is so much volatility in the FX, doctored really by governments and central banks, there's a lot of risk to it. So people go more towards things like uh, treasuries or their equivalents around the world, uh, the, the Bund, uh, the GILT, the JGB, so that's the German, the UK, and the Japanese government bond. Uh, and we go there because they're very safe. We consider them to be risk-free assets. All right, so in, I don't know if anybody's uh, gone through a finance in college, uh, it's what we are taught as being essentially our risk-free asset, zero risk. There is a lot of risk associated to it, especially in volatility terms, but that's what we assume is zero risk. And more importantly, that's the, all the, you know, uh, when conspiracy theorists say that the financiers are, are dominating the world, those are the people that you need to be worried about, and they're the ones that look at treasuries as being safe haven. I need to get my client's funds into something that has zero risk and assumed treasuries zero risk. So it's the playbook. It is the, you open any kind of investment in finance, especially global macro economic book, you're going to see that they say treasuries as your safe haven. You're absolute risk free. All right? And if these are the people with the most amount of money who are, this is their set mind track, things go wrong, go treasuries, we too need to be mindful of this. Okay. Now a lot of distortion here because of central banks, and this is where the new state of uh, treasury start uh, to come into gear. And this is why things are a little bit weird um, when it comes to treasuries. If you consider that it's supposedly risk-free, U.S. treasuries, you actually don't have the risk-free measure. You don't have a AAA status across all three of the three major credit rating agencies. Standard & Poor's back in August 2011 downgraded them from a AAA to AA+. That might be a, l a small caveat but actually a lot of funds out there, a lot of financial institutions, essentially said in their covenants, we will not treat as safe haven, we will not put client funds into anything other than something that is considered triple A status. So back in 2011, things got a little, little weird. Um, I don't know if you remember trading around that time, but there was definitely volatility around this because it, it represents to these stalwart investors, these people of high finance, what do we do now? This is no longer suitable for what we said for our clients. And uh, there were a lot of, all right, we'll allow it. This is a one-off, okay, whatever uh, kind of mentality around it. And yet this might not be the only time we get a downgrade, especially nowadays as we continue to fight budgets. And we see deficits grow and we see th threats of intervention on behalf of the currency. That becomes a, a greater risk. This puts treasuries in a very different position. Now trade wars, which are going on obviously heavily right now, uh, is another factor of why treasuries are no longer what they used to be. Because now you have, especially the United States, putting out a lot of the trade wars, starting a lot of the trade wars with China. Uh, we're likely to move into the, you know, to Europe, uh, threats of Japan through autos, stuff like that. And what ends up happening is those countries that if we go back, you can see, and well, it's a little difficult to see perhaps on that, but the top holder is China, the second top holder of U.S. treasuries is Japan. What happens if the U.S. starts a trade war with Japan? There are already, there are already concerns about what's called the nuclear option with China potentially selling treasuries. They won't, I won't go into detail why, uh, but they really won't. Uh, they would just shoot themselves in both feet rather than one. Um, but Japan certainly can start to unwind and diversify. There is a need to diversify away from the U.S. Just look at what happened in 2009 when you had US, or 2008 subprime housing in the United States was a, a catalyst for a global financial crisis. There's a need to get away from the connection of the U.S. It's going to take a long time. Not going to happen anytime soon. But there is a march forward. And this moves treasuries away from that traditional safe haven that they once represented. And financiers around the world need to second guess, do I really go to this if things are burning right now? And they're going to start thinking more and more, perhaps not. 
Uh, and of course, you have the Federal Reserve. And this is true of most of the major central banks. They are very aggressive uh, in buying their own local government debt. And this significantly distorts the market. So the Fed is a heavy owner, about 3.7 trillion or 3.8 trillion US treasuries at the moment. Uh, and that is a massive amount of treasuries. Uh, they are one of the largest holders. And you can imagine that can distort, not just by their actions, but also taking a lot of the supply of the market away. Can you imagine what happens if everyone buys most of the shares in the S&P 500? And then what happens with the much smaller stock of, of shares to trade? It would be smaller buying or selling that has more dramatic movements. Right? So it has a kind of amplifier effect. So what kind of risk aversion would see, let's say, US treasuries being the principal asset? All right. So if we, and we'll see the other ones next, but uh, if we saw US treasuries were the thing that was charging higher, and treasuries and yields move inversely to each other, just uh, a little caveat, but if treasuries were being bought up hand over fist, you would see that headline in, in top news. It's not like it's going to be a mysterious thing to find. You would see it very readily. Treasuries would be bought if we're talking about a severe financial crisis, All right. particularly if people were favoring U.S. Treasuries almost over almost anything else. That is a sign that there is essentially panic here and now, and the world of finance thinks that something is very structurally wrong. They will be going to U.S. AAA or what used to be AAA havens, and they're going to revert to their textbook training. They would only do that if they were forced to do so quickly. So if you see Treasuries bid above everything else, one, it's either the Fed, or two, something is very, very wrong with the financial structure. And that's, uh, that would be an instance where I would say, really go to low risk, neutral cash exposure or, or withdrawal on most of your risky assets, okay? Second one, so most of you said you, you were familiar with FX or traded FX, the dollar, all right? For us, the dollar is, in FX, is the number one, you know, obvious safe haven. It is the most liquid currency, and it is definitely aligned very nicely to what is traditionally known as havens. So what you have here is the uh, US dollar, the DXY dollar index. This is a weekly chart versus the VIX volatility index. All right. And as you can see, when there are big spikes in the VIX, the dollar tends to do very, very well as, as well. So this is the dollar versus capital moving out of other countries, so yen or pound or Aussie or Kiwi or CAD or all those other majors that you might be familiar with. Now the textbook view of the US dollar, it is the world's most liquid currency by far. And actually what you see there is the composition of official foreign exchange reserves, or also known as COFR, from the IMF. And what this shows is the amount of foreign exchange reserves. So essentially how much currency is used around the world. That top line is the dollar. The next line down is the euro. All right. The dollar represents about 63% of total reserves. The euro represents essentially 21%. Everything after that is, very, is much lower. So the yen and the pound are, are about the same at about 4%. So when things go wrong and people are seeking out liquidity, it's fairly clear where they go. They will go to the dollar and maybe they'll go to the euro. Makes things really interesting nowadays when people are talking about what's happening to the currencies as they're being proactively devalued by their respective central banks. Uh, you have trade wars. And let's say the dollar, the euro, and the yen are all under severe pressure. No one really wants to go to all, any uh, of those three then things get really interesting. And that's actually where it's going to get to the end of our, our presentation. But the US dollar is also considered kind of a vehicle to safety. So if I were, so let's give you an example. If I were Deutsche Bank, well, bad example. They're bad. Uh, they're not in a very good position right now. Uh, let's say that I'm, I don't know, Standard Charter, uh, British Bank. If they're, if they're in trouble and they're, and they're looking at their, their situation and they want to, uh, let's say, deleverage out of a global macro exposure, all right. And I have exposure to Australian stocks, I have exposure to US stocks, I have exposure to European stocks, and everything is, is starting to go poor. I want to put my, set and my capital into something safe. So they will go into US dollars in large disproportionate amounts. But they're not going to stop in dollars. We don't stop in currency. 
Major financial institutions cannot go to something that has zero return, which currencies generally have zero return. Even us uh, trading FX, spot FX, we don't stop in the currency itself. We actually have it parked in swaps, overnight swaps. That's why you earn or pay a carry. All right. So they need to go to something else, and what they're going to go to is usually treasuries or U.S. money markets, especially in severe risk aversion. So we benefit the dollar because people are going on to something else, but it still benefits the dollar. So when you have the U.S. dollar, you are exposing yourself to the largest financial system. You're exposing yourself to certainly a high credit quality. You're exposing yourself to the most liquid markets in the world. It's essentially safety. It's, it's, I, I'm swimming in a very, very deep pool with the U.S. dollar, so that's where I'm going to find my, my safe net, my safe harbor. But things are really going topsy-turvy for the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is really one of the most distorted safe havens that we have right now. People usually expect it to be an absolute safe haven. It, it d does not qualify by that standard anymore. Uh, because you can see from the U.S. policies, especially monetary policy in the world, that has created an enormous amount of volatility. So the Fed was the first to really start normalizing back in December 2015 when they, they started to first hike their rates. No one else really followed them, kind of created a problem, kind of created a situation we're in now. They have about 2.5% at the top line of their range. Everyone else has essentially zero. Uh, so it actually made the U.S. dollar into not a safe haven currency. It made it into a carry currency. So it's like a, it's a dividend stock of FX world now. So the dividend stocks are not usually the safe havens. So it created a, a really unusual mix for the benchmark dollar, where in fact you can see a lot of initial risk aversion actually hurts the U.S. dollar. Because people have gone long U.S. dollar, U.S. assets from around the world because they think, oh, I can get a little bit more yield there. They actually have a yield. Whereas things like uh, in Europe or Switzerland where it's negative, people are actually going short there because I can't make any kind of return to offset actually the benchmark rates or the inflation, the lack of inflation there. So the dollar becomes a very unusual position, even more so when we talk about the situation in... Uh, competitive devaluation, so essentially currency war. And there's been accusations by the president that euro, the euro and the yuan were being artificially devalued uh, and that it required or ne needed and necessitated a response. And he's been trying to push the Fed to do that. And he'd do it through policy, so essentially cut rates aggressively and it would drive the currency down and hopefully it would pull, you know, it would make the U.S. more competitive with lower rates. But at the same time, if, if you do that, you're talking about the lar world's largest currency. Again, if we go back, you're talking about something that represents 60% of the reserves. Actually, 88% of total purchases made in the world are through dollars. If you try to artificially devalue the U.S. dollar, you're talking about a systemic volatility. People can't get away from that. So it creates even greater uncertainty in the threat of a currency war. All right. So what kind of risk aversion would motivate people to go to the U.S. dollar above all else in this kind of situation? Let's say that risk aversion kicks in and the dollar was doing better than treasuries, which we just talked about, which would be unusual. But um, let's say that there is uh, that kind of risk aversion. That would be actually a systemic financial crisis. So you're talking about people truly concerned about what's going on in the financial world. It could also be that they're much more concerned about what's going on in Europe or Asia, and all that capital is trying to flood over to the United States for safety, which is not far-fetched. You look at Europe, and you're talking about a lot of uncertainty and stability of community. Uh, there is, the, let's say, the Brexit, or you have Italy, uh, who are constantly prodding the stability there. Or you look at Asia and China and Japan creating problems in their local areas could push more people over to the United States or U.S. liquidity. But if you see in particular, and this is a, something I would, I'd highlight, if you see that people have a preference for the dollar but not a preference for treasuries and risk aversion, I would be very concerned. Because that would be insinuating that you have severe risk aversion, and yet people aren't going to treasuries, which are their status quo like we just talked about. That would insinuate that something very wrong has uh, happened in the financial system and stability is being questioned, the, the traditional havens are being questioned. And in the, in, the, in the heat of the moment, if people aren't going back to what's textbook, there is definitely something financially uh, unsound. 
and we're probably we're talking about a, a financial crisis to more than rival the 2008 situation. So just uh, something to keep mindful of. So the haven that we have here is the Japanese yen. And actually, to, to clarify, what you have is a, a equally weighted yen index. So a yen index is actually a culmination of currencies. It's, in, it's actually, so as the yen advances, uh, you see the actual rise here. Now, if you're actually an FX trader, you are probably aware that the yen is the second currency and all of its pairings. It is not the first currency. So it actually, it's inverted from what you're, you're normally used to. But I wanted to show that the yen rises typically when risk aversion kicks in because what you have on that blue line is the S&P 500 flipped upside down. So traditionally when risk aversion kicks in, the yen tends to rise. Or if you're an FX trader, something like the Euro yen drops or the pound yen drops or the Aussie yen drops. So we're talking about two currencies. The one that drops is the one on the, set, the, the second currency in the pair is usually advancing. Okay. Now, a textbook view of the Japanese yen, this is only, I don't want to get too wonky, if, and just in case you're not already in the FX markets, uh, but I think most of us uh, that traded FX at all, if you've ever traded the, year, the dollar yen, you'd have recognized, especially recently, that you have a wave of risk aversion. And you have, let's say, the US dollar versus the Japanese yen, so USD JPY. It actually goes down. So the yen actually appreciates the dollar actually declines in risk aversion, which seems to go against or defy the logic that we just laid out with the US dollar. And that I've actually had a lot of conversations both with uh, individual traders, I've had a lot of uh, disagreements with uh, strategists. I've had disagreements with uh, dealers and, and even CEOs. The Japanese yen is not a traditional safe haven. The reason the Japanese yen actually appreciates significantly when you talk about risk aversion is because people use this as a funding currency for long risk trades. So in essence, think of it this way. We'll make a stock analogy. So people are borrowing against something else in the financial system, getting money from their broker, and they're putting it into a long stock trade. That's what they're doing with, with FX. That's what they're doing with the Japanese yen. So let's say that risk aversion kicks in and you're long equities. The first thing you do is not just, oh, I'm going to go find a safe haven, take off your risky trades. The first thing you do, right? So the first thing you're going to do with a long, let's say, dollar yen position is take off that long carry trade, as we call it. You, you're selling the dollar, buying back the Japanese yen because you're trying to go flat. You're not adding to the Japanese yen, you're going flat. You're taking a position off. And this is mistaken for safety. But it is the third largest economy. It does line up very nicely. This is uh, actually FX-based volatility, uh, the purple line over the yen. It, it seems to align nicely. So it, it looks like a safe haven, but it's, a, it's really a safe haven in disguise. And it's that funding currency position that really skews it. It will act like a safe haven in very certain, especially early phase risk aversion. But if things get intense, the Japanese yen does not just continuously rally because you don't have an unlimited amount of long carry trade to unwind. Eventually, people are going to be flat. And then they need to move their capital over to something that's genuinely safe. And while the Japanese economy is the third largest in the world, I don't know if you've seen, but they, they haven't had inflation of any kind of measure for three decades. They are still essentially roiled by a savings and loan crisis from the 80s. And if that's your mind of stability, then I, we, we, can't, we won't see it eye to eye. Uh, it is not a safety metric at all. It is first taking something risky off, and it's treated as such. Because if you really want to know the state of the affairs in Japan, their Bank of Japan is by far the most aggressive central bank amongst the majors. So a lot of us probably have uh, some opinions on the Fed. Some of us think they don't do enough. Some of us think that they're crazy and they've just went way too far. I'm more in the latter camp. Um, and a lot of central banks have gone very, very far in, buying everything in sight, creating some sense of masked optimism. The Bank of Japan is in a class of their own. We're talking about the percentage of their GDP is, is astounding. There's just no one that can come close to them. All right? And that's a sign of the instability. 
And that's not missed uh, by global financiers. They know that's the case. They're not going to park their money in Japan unless they're essentially a Japanese bank. It goes somewhere else. It goes usually to the US or Europe if, uh, if it's a different case. But what kind of risk aversion would show benefit or appetite for the Japanese yen? If we were seeing the Japanese yen rise, but not the dollar, for example, so dollar yen is declining alongside the S&P 500, what would that say to us? That would say to me that this is just mild risk aversion. That this is the traditional risk aversion that people are taking off stocks, they're taking off their emerging markets exposure, everything that's a little bit too, too risky. I'm taking that down. I'm not, I'm not panicking, I'm just taking off risk. So it's a very different situation if you're talking about full tilt I need, I need the exit now kind of mentality. That would probably see the dollar yen rise. So in fact, the dollar yen is a great barometer about just how intense the financial situation is across the globe. So if you aren't an FX trader and you haven't been looking at dollar yen, I'd actually incorporate it and just appreciate it for its, its nuance. It can give you a very important signal, just like the next one we're gonna talk about. All right. I, I've, I am pretty certain that everyone here is familiar with gold. Um, it is a absolute safe haven, and I am not a gold bug, not at all. In fact, up until maybe a year ago, I thought uh, gold bugs were crazy people. Um, but, you know, a broken clock's ro uh, right twice, uh, twice a day. So uh, right now, gold bugs uh, are definitely finding the right safety and for actually the right reasons at this point. Uh, but we have it here, gold is the orange, obviously the purple is global stimulus. So the amount of, of capital that the central banks have flooded into the system. All right, and there's a reason we're gonna look at that, a very important reason in a second. But what you have here is a textbook view of gold, what we usually expect from it. And on, that, uh, uh, on the, the, the right side is actually a, uh, it's not a standard, it's, it's a logarithmic chart of gold because uh, it's obviously gone through a lot of swings historically, uh, going back that far. And on the left side, you actually have inflation, all right, CPI year over year. Most of us treat gold as kind of an inflation hedge, um, which is actually fairly accurate, but uh, not for the reasons most people assume. They just kind of think it's, uh, oh, it's a, that's the equation, inflation and gold. It's not necessarily the case. Uh, and especially outside of the United States, it's treated as, an, as a safe haven just by, by line of sight. That's because you look at somewhere like, you know, core euro, uh, it hasn't been around that long, it's only traded since 1999. You look at uh, Eastern Europe, where the currencies are extremely volatile, emerging markets, people aren't going to want to park a lot of their money in their local economy, so they need an alternative outside of the, the influence of the governments that can often be very uh, volatility inducing. And usually that's precious metal like gold, which trades globally, all right? And many people actually treat gold in that, in that same vein as kind of a protest to governments. Like, I think the, my government's driving our, our economy to a hell in a handbasket, so I'm gonna go to gold. Um, and that's, it's not just US, that's everywhere. Everyone thinks that way. So the thing with gold though is, it is outside the influence of central banks and governments. And they can try to corner the market, but it's such a large market and there's such a global outcry when somebody tries to corner something like gold. It's not silver, it's not natural gas. Those, uh, those commodities have been cornered. Uh, you cannot necessarily corner this for very long uh, because it will blow back to you. Now, also gold has zero yield and this is why I don't like it as a long-term investment. If things are going all right, you need yield, you need return. You need dividends, carry, whatever you wanna call it. Gold offers none of that, all right? But right now, Yields are close to zero. I know not in the United States, but globally, you're talking about essentially zero or negative for many countries around the world. So gold is a much more attractive, especially safe haven. I can say, stay in it with safety and I'm not uh, losing money like I am with certain currencies. All right. And it is, and this is the most important factor here, it is one of the few alternatives to the, uh, to the currency war, to the universal devaluation of currency. So let's say that President Trump continues forward with uh, trying to drive the currency down. He has aides looking into means of doing so. So if the dollar starts to drop, all right, what's gonna happen is the rest of the world's gonna retaliate, all right? 
and they're going to retaliate by trying to push the euro down, the yen down. They're all going to respond, and, and probably in a coordinated manner. And you know, it, it, if you act, if you act coordinated against the dollar, yeah, you can you can drive the dollar uh, back higher. But what it's going to end up happening is it's going to get very very distortionary. You're going to have enormous amounts of volatility in trading, which I I don't mind. I like I like volatility. I'm sure most of you like volatility, but it becomes very difficult to measure. All right, volatility is risk. You should avoid volatility. I know our habits do not process that way. We, we flock to volatility like mosquitoes to a bug light. And that's an uh, accurate analogy. It's very risky. But when you have that degree of volatility, it really creates a problem in the perception of, is this safety? Do I find safety in treasuries? Do I find safety in dollar? No. That's when things really start to go off the rails. So in the event of a currency war, and actually that, that chart on the right is uh, the amount of negative yielding debt around the world, um, that, is, that is really the, the genesis, the source of what central banks have done. They've created a very distorted financial system. Yes, in an attempt to kind of jumpstart economic activity, and at this point over the past four years, five years, more to accelerate econ economic activity, I would say that they're probably not doing too well right now, um, it's considering they're all in and they're still not uh, rendering their kind of impact. But this creates a very appealing nature for what gold represents. If it is outside the influence of those governments because it cannot be manipulated through supply, then gold is one of the few things that can get away from that, especially in a currency war. When everything FX starts to go vol volatile, and it's not just FX, it's those, those government bonds. Those go volatile too. So you're talking about a systemic financial crisis where people start to recognize, oh, these central banks can't do anything anymore. The governments can't do anything anymore except for cause more volatility. Where do I go? Where do I find safety? And gold's really the only place that does that. So if I see gold continue to rise, which has been the case, over the past six, eight months, if you've, probably, if you've been watching it, it's been blowing through 1,300, 1,400, and it's going up at the same time the S&P 500 is going up. That tells me something is fundamentally wrong with what we assume from the markets. So you might have people kind of clamoring for long equities, but they're very concerned constantly about the structure, about how stable it is, how much I should, especially now, S&P 500, well, it's just off, but if you're going to get long now, you're, you're talking about investing a record amount of cost to get exposure. That's what that represents. That's how expensive it is to get long now, the S&P 500. That is not a good time to go long, especially when I'm looking at the backdrop and the, something like a haven, gold, which is normally bought when it, you're talking about safety, is rising as well. And not to mention you know, global equities are trading a significant discount to the U.S. They're nowhere near their record highs. You're talking about emerging market assets, junk bonds, uh, carry trade. All of those are trading significantly lower than what you see from like, the likes of the S&P 500. So it becomes a, a really questionable environment for the investment that we've seen over time. And gold, as it continues to march higher, I haven't taken a trade in gold in, in quite a long time, but... I watch it on a near constant basis because everything that I see come in, especially economic data, and I see, oh, gold just continues to rise through this, but S&P 500 also rose through this. I know that there is something fundamentally wrong. People might be, let's say, uh, willing to punt a little bit more, as they say in the UK, take a little bit more exposure, ride that wave a little bit further to its crest, but they are not convinced. They are not uh, showing conviction. And gold becomes that ultimate safe haven that if things start to fall apart, treasuries, dollar, yen, all going topsy-turvy, all those safe havens we talked, to, uh, talked about thus far, and obviously all the risk-oriented assets like global equities are dropping sharply, I would expect that gold is probably rallying close to that record high that it set previously at 1800 probably even further. And in the environment that we are, we are in right now where all the dependency is on these major central banks, we could easily accidentally fall into that kind of scenario. So watch gold and watch gold very, very closely. And that's the risk disclaimer. So those are the four assets. And can those assets all, let's say, rise at the same time? Sure. But if I see all four of those things rising at the same time, I don't think it's severe risk aversion. It's when 
things like the Japanese yen and the dollar start to wobble and fall off, that I start to think that it's extreme risk aversion, like financial stability concern, as we saw back in 2008, kind of risk aversion. So look at the group and definitely uh, consider them together. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I, I talk about it pretty much on a daily basis. Gold is definitely in my, my rotation when I do my daily analysis. If I see something that says financial stability is, is un, uncertain, if we are looking at, a, at the start of a crisis, I will definitely say I am concerned. But I'm, just to be clear, I'm not like a, a running for the hills kind of person. If I am genuinely concerned, I will just won't touch it. And I haven't, I haven't been long, well, I haven't been long equities uh, through a diversified exposure for about a year now. So I am cautious. I, I, I fall on kind of the middle ground of caution. Oh, well, I mean, you can always come to watch the videos on daily effects, but um, it's generally if you see the, the relationships of these various assets. So if you see that, let's say, for example, gold continues to rise and treasuries and dollar are amiss, then looking at that combination of things, you would already start to know that something's wrong. Now, of course, if this is happening also while S&P 500 continues to rise, like there seems to be risk appetite here, but risk aversion there, uh, then it hasn't fully happened yet. But what that talks about is it, that it's just an erosion of the foundation of confidence that the financial system has. And eventually, if we have something that's a catalyst, like the U.S. goes to a trade war with Europe, then that could be something that suddenly it's a spark to a lot of gasoline on the ground. So it's, it's the relationship that you get between these havens and a preference that you see for those certain havens. But, I, I mean, if you come and visit, I, I, I do daily videos. I, I talk about, like, what my... My assessment is of the situation now. Yeah. No problem. Yes. Uh, Basel three is brought up a lot. It's, it, but I, I, I kind of put it in the same category as uh, as the the constant uh, hope associated to the SDR. So the SDR is the IMF. The IMF's effort to try to manufacture a currency where they can kind of disconnect from the U.S. Um, because there's so much influence. The world is trying to deleverage from the United States because 2008 created a lot of problems, and it was really it was leverage everywhere globally was the problem, but it was obviously the leverage out of the United States that tipped everything off. Um, so their efforts have been nothing short of just trivial. They've not, they've not really gotten good ground on SDR. But Basel III, it's the same kind of situation. It, it kind of harkens back to the, uh, the reversal of Bretton Woods, um, which actually, I think today is the 75th anniversary of Bretton Woods. So congratulations, everyone. That's when we stopped using gold standard. Um, I just don't, it, it's, a, it's a means too late. If you, if you were doing it during calm times, then it would probably be much more rigid, much more, you know, it would be much more soothing to the financial structure. But if you try to kind of slapdash it now, especially with everything so distorted from government bond purchases, it's probably just going to create a, a fallible structure which people will probably depend upon, which, let's be honest, most of the banks won't depend upon it. The financial institutions will just revert back to their, their playbook. They'll go back to U.S. Treasuries. Just because they're, that's, you know, everyone that's been in the financial system has been schooled from university that if things go wrong, go back to risk-free Treasuries because that's what you're pricing off of. Even options and derivatives are priced off of risk-free uh, treasuries. And that's just, I mean, they have so much skin in the game. To divorce yourself and kind of follow Basel III or follow SDR is not, you know, it's not really something that they're willing to do unless everyone else does it first and no one wants to be the first major buy-in. Unless you're like an emerging market country and no one's really following them into the dark. Any other questions? No? All right, well, I'll be over at the booth if you have any individual questions. Thank you very much for coming.